The timeline for Higurashi was a little straightforward until the recent release of Go and Sotsu, where now other properties and timelines of a story dismissed as non-canon have begun to be reevaluated. Today, I'll be starting a series where we go through every Higurashi event in order of when they happened, forming the ultimate Higurashi timeline in an attempt to make everything coherent again. I plan to release one of these videos per month, so let's hop right into it. Most people would assume that the beginning of Matsuri Bayashi would go here, as that has Takano's backstory in it, but our story roots back even further than that. The first inklings take place in a story that happened a very long time ago in an arc known as Kotoho Gushihen. Some may remember this from me briefly talking about it in one of my previous videos, but this arc is none other than Hanyu's complete, detailed backstory. It was talked about briefly in Matsuri Bayashi and in the epilogue of Saikora Hoshi, but they decided to go in-depth on this DS and PlayStation exclusive arc. This fleshes out the lore and origins of almost everything in Hinamisawa, which for those that don't know, is the town that all of the events of Higurashi take place inside of, so despite how little this arc is talked about, it might be one of the most important arcs in the entire series. Also, for those that don't know, because I'm aware some people that might not have watched the show are watching this, Hanyu is a character introduced in the later half of the original series, who is a character like a ghost that is the reason that our main character Rika is in the predicament that she is in. She ends up becoming a very integral part to that story, but I won't spoil it too much because, you know, I want you to experience this while you can. I'm gonna have to trim out a lot though because the complete story is nearly 12 hours worth of content. It's extremely detailed and pretty well written in my opinion, but there is a lot that doesn't matter for the overall purpose of this series, which is going to be a timeline of events. We're not told exactly how long ago this story takes place, but it's safe to say that it happened either during or before the feudal era of Japan. Now this is something I doubt any of you have heard of before, but we're going to need to talk about the Ryun, an advanced alien species. They are extremely similar to humans in appearance, they are much more intelligent and have gained horns during their evolution as a species. The world they were living in is nearing the end of its time, and is beginning to destroy itself which leads them to creating something called the Linosis, also known as Control Gates. These gates are devices that allow them to travel to other worlds through a method called Phase Transition, which means they transform themselves or objects into streams of information and algorithms that reconstruct back into the original state on the other side of the gate. Basically, it's an interdimensional teleporter. The only limitation on it was that its transfer could only take a certain amount of mass, and exceeding it could cause issues. There were a original few waves of Ryun that left their homeworld to go to Earth, and this bunch of folks would be known as the Putis, or Purebloods. Eventually, the destruction of their homeland becomes too great, which leads to all of the Ryun having to abandon ship, causing floods of them to try and go through the gate. But because they're all jumping into the gate at the same time, it causes an overload since there is too much mass, resulting in some of the Ryun that go through to not have a physical body, instead being trapped in what the story refers to as an astral form. To us, this is simply known as a ghost. Think of how Hanyu is portrayed in most of the story. That's how these guys are. They couldn't maintain these forms forever due to how much information was on Earth, so over time, they began to merge or assimilate with human babies. Not like assimilation from the thing though. That is pretty nasty. This one seems pretty peaceful. Anyways, not important. This would give birth to human hybrids for them. This was easy to achieve since babies could take on the personality and mind of the reunions with ease, since they're like a blank canvas. These hybrids would be called griffs, or simply half-bloods, but are most commonly known and referred to in this story as demons, and they would keep a lot of the power of the reunions on top of their personalities, and help move forward human technology and civilization due to their retained advanced intelligences. Memories, however, would be lost with assimilation. The demons would continue to immigrate to the world through babies until one year an epidemic broke out, spreading across the nearby humans. The epidemic resulted in a lot of infant deaths and big chains of infertility for those that had the disease. The outbreak of this epidemic was believed to be related to the reunions coming to the planet, and the disease surely made them all panic. Instead of waiting for newborn babies to pop up again, they began trying to invade the minds of children and teenagers, which naturally did not go very well. While babies are like blank canvases, Children and teens are developing already, so they notice very quickly that there is something going on in their brain that should not 
be there. This led to the demon's personalities fighting with the human hosts, and their mental troubles and the mixing of their genetics would cause tremendous stress to the host's brain, and at terminal stages would result in the demon's personality taking over, but due to the stress that they endure, would make them incredibly brutal and aggressive. Sound familiar? I believe this is the origin of the infamous Hinamizawa syndrome, which means that this mysterious disease was most likely caused by none other than, yes, aliens. In the main arcs, it's discussed that Hinamizawa syndrome has origins going back way into the past, where the town was called Onigafuchi and was based around a swamp. Well, my friends, that is when Kotohoguchi takes place, although it's not entirely confirmed that this epidemic and merging of demons is what led to the syndrome being born, it sure as hell seems like they're the same. What would be a sick thing that you can confirm as an audience member is if you're subscribed to the channel. That's right, sellout time, because there are a lot of you that watch these videos that don't bother to hit that nice red button. Come on, peeps. You gotta watch my other videos too. Subscribe, keep me going. I would appreciate it if you do. Anyways, these sick demons begin to kill a lot of humans, and could also corrupt other demons to become sickly like them. To deal with this uprising of what they would call demonifying of griffs, and in some instances also fellow purebloods, the majority of the Buddhist population rose up to kill the rampaging and sickly griffs. They began to call themselves the High, or the Feathered Peers, and would spend their life both protecting humans from the demons and killing the rampaging brethren since they felt responsible for this happening. There were 16 Buddhist families, the strongest being known as the Jetta, who would watch over the demons as observers. Of these Jettas was Hyrun Yasmal Jetta, who we all would later come to know as Hanyu. For the purposes of this video, I'm simply just going to refer to her as Hanyu, because pronouncing her Ryun name is a lot harder for me. Wow, that was a lot of information and background on these aliens. But we're just grazing the tip of the iceberg. All of what we just went over was simply the setup for Koto Hogushi. What we're about to get into is the actual story of this arc, so buckle up, get yourself a snack, and get ready because we're about to go balls deep. Maybe I shouldn't have used balls deep, but you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Anyways, let's get going. Some decades or so into Hanyu's life, she is found slaying rampaging demons that are attacking the village of Onigafuchi. The demons and their leaders, the chieftain, know they'll lose against Hanyu so they lure her into a mansion and blow parts of it up. This backfires, and she defeats them. Once the battle has concluded, she senses a human in the mansion and goes back inside to find a lone baby in its dead mother's arms, somehow surviving despite the entire house having been destroyed. She initially plans to kill the baby so that it doesn't have to suffer without a mother, but instead picks it up and gives it to the townsfolk, telling them that the child has a piece of her soul in it. If they protect and raise it, she promises to protect Onigafuchi. Hanyu's promise is the beginning of the legend of Oyashira-sama, and this child she gives them is known in the village at the time as the reincarnation of Oyashira-sama. Before Hinamizawa was, well, Hinamizawa, the town was called, as I said earlier, Onigafuchi, and was heavily based around, again, a swamp. The swamp in the present day is considered very dangerous, and the citizens of the town are advised to stay away from it. However, a long time ago, it was a hub of the town. There are a few legends of Onigafuchi Swamp told throughout the story of Higurashi, and it's likely that Kotohogushi is the route to some of, if not all of the legends in the town's history. Also, speaking of the original series, I was a part of a fantastic Higurashi abridged by the amazing studio Weeb7. If you haven't seen it already, be sure to check it out. I'll put a card for it above and it'll be in the description below. But don't go watch it now though. My watch time depends on you staying here, so like, please keep watching this video. <laughs> Anyways. 20 years have passed since the last event, and Hanyu is currently visiting Onigafuchi. She begins to vent to Ryun Oak, an artificial intelligence created by the Ryun, as Oak fixes Hanyu's sword. Hanyu tells her about how she isn't proud of how many demons she had to kill, and that the entire village burned down due to her not acting quickly enough. She's even lost a lot of her fellow Pudus, such as her friend Shezhen, and expresses how she's worried about how much crossbreeding is going on between demons and humans. The humans and Pudus population is dwindling as the demons population is thriving. She begins to wonder if maybe the demon that attacked Onigafuchi 20 years ago was actually a Pudus, since it seemed to have strong resistance to the disease and could easily demonize griffs. Oak says that she's pondering too much and will eventually run herself dry, 
so she needs to go and take a break. So Hanyu listens and leaves to go take a bath where she continues to dwell on the past anyways, thinking now about how a Putis elder was telling her when she was younger and born into the world that she didn't have to atone for Yoon's sins and hunt demons. This causes her to wonder what her true role in the world is, looking at her reflection and wondering how she could live peacefully if she didn't have horns. While taking a bath, she senses both a bloodthirsty creature and a human, and leaves to go check it out thinking that it might be a demon. She finds a bear about to attack a blue-haired priest, and she leaps at the bear, wrestling it into the nearby waterfall. The boy, shocked, dives in after to attempt to save her when the bear's corpse floats to the surface. Hanyu emerges with her nails drawn very large, completely naked. She realizes and leaps into the waterfall to hide herself, and the boy does a very horrible job hiding how happy he is to see her body, which leads Hanyu to launch him into the river. This boy introduces himself as Riku Furude, a member of the Furude family at this time and the same child that Hanyu saved 20 years prior. It turns out he got adopted into the shrine family of Onigafuchi. Hanyu considers erasing his memories of her, but Oak advises against it. She expects Riku to be scared of her or making a big deal about her horns, but to her surprise, they have a good back and forth without him bringing it up. They talk about her being Oyashira-sama and her body, <laughs> because she was naked, and then eventually her horns are brought up. He doesn't seem frightened at all, and expresses that he has no reason to be afraid of his savior. Riku asks for her name, which Hanyu is surprised by since he's never been asked that, and says her name is Hyrieun. Riku stares at her pretty blankly, and even after Hanyu repeats it, he cannot for the life of him say her name correctly. Apparently, the Ryun language is very hard for a human to hear correctly because of its complex dialect. So that means this entire time I could have been pronouncing it incredibly wrong because I should not be able to speak it. Riku decides to nickname her since he cannot pronounce it, naming her the feathers of the bird wings in the land. Or, in more simple terms, Hanyu. That's right guys, the nickname we all know her by now was given to her all these years ago by Riku. Hanyu accepts her nickname happily, with her heart beating very rapidly. Aw, that's cute. With this being the first time she's felt very valued. From the fight with the bear, Hanyu's gotten her foot pretty messed up, so Riku begins to treat it. He asks her to go back to the village with him so he can continue to treat it, and after some initial hesitation, she agrees to come back to Onigafuchi. Hanyu found herself really wanting to continue talking with Riku. Now a month has passed in the story, which some of you guys might be surprised to find out this, but Hanyu is now living with Riku, and has been for a little while. She feels extremely comfortable staying and talking with him, despite her never feeling this comfortable with even her own kind. Riku is teaching her to be more in touch with her feminine side, since most of Hanyu's life she has been both a soldier and largely hung around men. She's also loving Riku's cooking since she had to starve herself a lot being a soldier and running around a lot, although the two are worried how the village will react once they see Hanyu, since they're aware Riku is living with someone at the shrine. To compensate for this, they would give her a hood and change Hanyu out of her Ryun armor. Riku admits that he is in extreme obsession with Miko outfits, which for those that don't know, these are the outfits that a lot of Japanese media tends to portray shrine maidens in, and he finds himself collecting quite a few of them and pleading with Hanyu to wear one. She hesitantly puts one on, but then gets really angry since it shows a lot of cleavage. She notices that they're all in fact perverted, and Riku admits that he's had all the ones he currently owns tailor-made for her. But yeah, this is how Hanyu came to her now signature Miko outfits. Hanyu is surprised with how much she's enjoying being around Riku, and Oak says that it might be because Hanyu is growing feelings for him. She very quickly dismisses this thought, however, even though she would find herself getting jealous of Shino, who is a member of the Kimiyoshi family. A bit of time passes, about three months, and Hanyu has begun to adjust very well to living with Riku. She's learned to cook, to be very in touch with her femininity, femininity, Femininity? Femininity? Fe femininity. Fe whatever, it's the word for being very feminine. I cannot pronounce this for the life of me. Although she still does not like the Miko outfits. Riko really wants to show Hanyu off to the village, since he firmly believes that they will accept her. But she's still hesitant to the idea of doing so. The reason for this being them not accepting her, and the sighting of a demon near Onigafuchi as well. Oak tells Hanyu to let the humans handle the situation themselves, since the Ryun have taught them how to manufacture gunpowder and to refine steel. Hanyu, naturally, 
isn't okay with this, since she wants to fulfill her role as a Jedi and not risk humans getting hurt. The demons have taken down many large villages and settlements around Onigafuchi, which makes her suspect that another pureblood might be behind this. Just as she suspects that a pureblood was around 20 years ago when the original attack on this village took place. She swears to slay the demons, and that she will consider how she feels about Riku after her duty has been done. She goes to tell Riku about her departure, to which he is sad naturally, but Hanyu tells him that she'll come back safely. As worried as he is, he bids her farewell and tells her to stay safe. She heads off to fight the demons in a battle much like the one 20 years ago. However, this time the demons were much more brutal, creative, and intelligent, using corpses as decoys. She fought 30 or so demons, receiving a ton of wounds in the process, but thankfully managing to make them back off. She returned back to the Furude Shrine, but instead of treating her wounds, she wants to go see Riku. She notices that the moon looks extra beautiful, which in Japan is an analogy for being in love, which is foreshadowing because she is going to lie with Riku. While the two hug each other, Hanyu comes to terms with being in love with Riku and wants to spend the rest of her life with him. Two years pass after she realizes her love, and Riku and Hanyu are now very comfortable with one another. Riku has finally gotten Hanyu to wear a Miko outfit, and they still bicker just like they used to. As they watch Cherry Blossoms fall together, Riku asks how many demons Hanyu has to off before she will finally be free of her mission. This fills her with a sense of existential dread, as she realizes she will outlive Riku, and wonders what she'll do once he dies. Riku expresses being worried that he might be a demon, but Hanyu says that he isn't one because she would have sensed it. Although, she doesn't know for certain if he is or isn't. So she's been giving him medicine over time to make sure his demon personality won't activate at all. They get into talking about a lot of philosophy involving Hanyu's mission, but Hanyu has a thought that her sticking around in the village might lead to an outbreak of illness much like the one that led to the demons rampaging. She's currently waiting for the Pudis she believes is behind the many settlement attacks to show itself, but Riku asks what she'll do if the pure blood doesn't come, and she gets to live peacefully. Hanyu begins to pawn possible options, although one specific thought of Riku marrying someone else ends up really bugging her. Riku interrupts her train of thought by telling her out of the blue that he loves her, and that his Miko outfit was a sign of courtship in the village since it was a short-sleeved kimono. He tells her that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. Hanyu is initially really overjoyed, but then her joy very quickly turns into extreme anger. She runs away towards the shrine grounds, and once Riku catches up to her, she expresses that this must be a cruel joke due to his Miko fetish. That Riku's confession of love seems disingenuous, and then she begins to cry for the first time in her multiple decades of life. He takes off her hood and looks at her horns, to which she says that no one would ever accept a demon like her. She has been feared and despised by humans for them. He tells her again that he loves her, and showers her in affection that she gradually accepts. She tells him that next time, he should confess when she isn't in something that he has a fetish for, and the two pledge to get married to one another at that moment. A few months go by yet again, and the two become very well acquainted with each other, and after some unusual hesitancy, Hanya becomes friends with Riku's friend Shino, who, again, is a member of the Kimiyoshi family. She's learned how to do a lot of housework now, and has developed a huge sweet tooth, usually consuming baked goods. After Shino and Hanyu get into a fight with Riku because he bought yet another Miko outfit, Hanyu throws up in a bush, and Shino realizes that she has morning sickness, meaning Hanyu is pregnant. Hanyu is initially overjoyed because she's been dreaming of having a child with Riku, but then her joy is met with a deep-rooted fear that the child is going to have Ryun blood. She worries that the kid might be birthed with horns, and doesn't want the child to be treated differently because of this. Or, even worse, that the child might be born a demon since it's half-blooded. She begins to worry so much about all the possibilities that could go wrong, so she dives into the swamp and she attempts to use Ryun technology to make it to where the baby never existed in the first place. Basically, removing it from existence. Oak advises against it because she knows it's not what Hanyu really wants, and that Hanyu is just in her own head since the AI can tell how thrilled Hanyu is to be pregnant. In the middle of her dilemma, Riku dives into the swamp. He comforts her, and Hanyu comes back to her senses, realizing that even if the kid has horns that Riku and her will still love the child the same. Several months pass, and Hanyu is well into her pregnancy now. 
She's in the middle of making food for Shino, and she thanks Riku and Shino for helping her become the person she is when WHAM! Contractions. Oh, it's baby time. Shino starts shooting instructions at Riku, and after several hours of intense labor, Hanyu gives birth to a baby girl. Her first worry is if the child has horns, but Riku tells her to not worry because the child is hornless. Hanyu cries tears of joy since her baby doesn't have the burden of horns as the cherry blossoms bloom outside, one happening to land right on the baby's forehead. Because of this, Hanyu names the baby Oka, which is a combination of the characters Cherry Blossom and Petal. They're very happy to welcome the new Furuday into the world, and Hanyu through childbirth realizes that she never really was alone, and she wants the child to never feel alone either, but where there is life, there will be loss. As Oak is reaching the end of her operational runtime, because of this, the sword will become almost a regular sword that can have additional powers if summoned, and Hanyu says Riku gave her a new name, Ryoyu. I may have said that wrong, but hopefully if I said it right it sounds familiar to some, as this is what I've dubbed the Looper Killing Sword from Higurashi Go and Sotsu. However, due to Oak going offline, the swamp that she usually dwelled in became very muddy. Not only that, the villagers had a growing fear of the swamp since a mangled corpse was allegedly found in it. Hanyu knows this is likely due to the cause of a demon, since there have been demon sightings at a nearby village. Much to Riku's discretion, Hanyu has to go fight the demon before it matures because it will become very hard to kill later on. It doesn't help that lately the villagers have been paranoid that the person Riku is hiding is one of the demons as well. Regardless, she promises to return once the demon has been taken care of, but doesn't know how long it will take. Before her departure, she gives him a necklace with a red crystal in the middle that he can use to call her back home. We get some additional lore for the Ryun, which is that while their bodies do not age after a certain point, their minds age backwards in a process called infantilization, meaning that as Hanyu ages, she will become more childlike mentally. After a certain point, she will be unable to change between astral and physical forms because she will become a ghost after not being able to have much mental control of herself. However, she will be able to maintain this form, or give certain powers of hers to humans through a method called sympathizing. Anyways, Hanyu sets out and finds a group of thieves who disguise themselves as demons to instill fear into the people. Hanyu pops up and they freak the fuck out, but she lets them run around since demons would be drawn to the pure blood instincts awakening. She herself feels an ever-growing bloodlust inside of her as the true demon arrives, engaging with it immediately. She sees that the demon is long past being able to be saved, and her blade grows to its signature three prongs as it stabs it in the chest. She goes to deliver the finishing blow, but misses for the first time ever. She's knocked to the ground and looks up at the demon, which to her horror, sees is wearing the necklace that she gave to Riku. Hanyu realizes that Riku must have finally awakened the demon instinct she had been working for so long to keep at bay, meaning that now he had become a demon. She figures out that this demon is in fact a putus and the one that attacked Onigafuchi 20 years ago. While the two are fighting, it confirms that it is the pure blood from 20 years ago, and after their last encounter he had dematerialized into a ghost form and watched her from the shadows. He waited years for a perfect chance to strike, and three years ago he found the perfect host, Riku. The demon wanted Riku as a host because he knew it would crush her soul to fight her husband. Hanyu isn't sure what to do since she doesn't want to kill her husband, but remembers that Riku wanted her to live. After blinding the demon, she picks up her sword once again and prepares the final blow while apologizing to Riku for what she has to do. She swears to become a demon and to take in the sins of those around her. She plunges her sword into the demon, voicing her love for him and promising that she'll never forget about the pain that she's feeling right now. She thinks that she hears him say to take care of Oka, and then she kills him. Now, this is pretty hard hitting and would start a big turning point in what has been so far a pretty wholesome and nice story. Typical Higurashi, you know? A good 10 years have passed since the death of Riku. Hanyu has abandoned the village since the events that took place, and the villagers felt very bad for judging Hanyu and Riku's relationship. Because of this, they decided to adopt Oka and treated her extremely well. She was raised by the Kimiyoshi and Sonozaki families, and when she was of age, would run the Furude Shrine by herself. Due to her final battle, Hanyu could not really maintain a physical form anymore, so she could only watch from a distance now. 
She misses Riku a lot, naturally, and looks at a cherry blossom tree that she and Riku used to name Oka. And, just like that, Oka appears. She can see Hanyu and asks her what she's doing there, which almost makes Hanyu break down. But she collects herself and introduces herself as Oyashiro-sama. Oka both meeps and nipaws, as well as sharing a very, very similar appearance to that of Rika. Which might be a reason why Hanyu took a big liking to Rika in the far future. After this unexpected sudden reunion, another 10 years randomly pass. I don't know why they decided to just have this happen and then go and jump another 10 years, but that's okay. Oka is practicing her swordsmanship with Hanyu being her teacher. Hanyu did not plan to stay for super long, but Oka asked her to come to her house since she now lived alone, wanting to live at the shrine to protect what was dear to her parents. She refrained from telling Oka that she was her mother, because she didn't think it was right of her because of how absent she was in Oka's life. Hanyu has lived outside the house, not wanting to go into it and letting old memories resurface, and has instead decided to live in the ritual storehouse. She has watched Oka grow up and become an adult, marrying the son of Shino Kimiyoshi, named Shoji, and they have a child named Fuka. Neither of them can see Hanyu, unfortunately, but at least the Furude name is going on since Shoji decided to take Oka's name. Thanks to Hanyu's help, Oka now knows her way around a sword really well, and Oka thinks of Hanyu like a mother. Ironic, isn't it? Pretty sadly ironic. One day, while she's dematerialized, she hears Shino talking to Oka about an illness that's broken out over the village, and Shino gives her some Chinese medicine not knowing if it would be useful at all. Good job, Shino. Love you, babe. Hanyu materializes to have a conversation with her, where Oka asks her to make medicine for the village since she knows Hanyu is capable of that, since she made life-saving medicine for her eight years prior when she was younger. Hanyu refuses since it's against this due to Ryun law, forbidding them to use their technology to help humans if these issues they're facing aren't caused by Ryuns. The two begin to argue when Fuka runs out to get Oka, and brings her into the house where Shoji has come down with an illness. She runs back out to Hanyu, and gets on her hands and knees and begs Hanyu to save her husband. She apologizes for being naive about wanting to save the village, and that she'll do anything to keep him from dying, even taking his place in death. Hanyu, not wanting to see her daughter suffer so, decides to make medicine for Shoji, and tells Oka that she hasn't done it in a while, so she might make too much. Which I think is a subtle way of Hanyu being nicer than she should be, wanting to help Oka save the village. The medicine she makes helps Shoji and the sick villagers recover quickly, calling Oka the reincarnation of Oyashiro-sama, and nicknaming the medicine Demon Medicine. The medicine made ways outside of the village, which Hanyu got a bad feeling about. Some time passes and Hanyu sleeps in the ritual house when Oka comes in and says the medicine has been taken from the storehouse. In fact, it was the only thing stolen from the storehouse. Hanyu gives her some more of the medicine but is concerned on why specifically that was the only thing to be taken. The door to the storehouse was locked, however, meaning that the people that opened it up were either the Kimiyoshis or the Sonozakis since they also had copies of the keys. She meets with the current head of each family, which is Shino from the Kimiyoshi side and Mao from the Sonozaki side, who is very disliked in the village by its elders since she came from outside the village. The haters includes Shino, which is odd to Hanyu since Shino was very accepting of her in the past, but she is acting this way now to uphold tradition of the three houses so that they don't lose influence. Sounds a little stupid, but like this makes sense for Japanese culture, so... I'll let it slide. She doesn't actually dislike Mao though, which is what matters here. They formulate a plan together to lure bandits to the storehouse under the notion that more medicine will be made, and is planned to be taken to a northern village the next day, which proves successful as bandits appear and are taken down very quickly. It turns out the person that was using the storehouse key was Oga's daughter, since she had been taking care of some nearby stray dogs. The next day, the bandits are interrogated, where Mao brings out some classic Sonazaki torture devices, making them piss themselves and open up. They confess to trying to steal the medicine since they were promised by someone a large amount of money. But upon further interrogation, they refuse to say who hired them. Mao swears to protect them if something were to happen to them, and they finally say the person who hired them was the current feudal lord. This shocks everyone in the area since someone with such a high position of power in their area is trying to steal something that is very dire and dear to their community. They gather later to discuss a letter sent by the Lord, demanding they give him the recipe to make the medicine. 
They realize that this won't be good for the village. Oka asks Hanyu if she can get the recipe for the medicine, and to her surprise, and mine too, honestly, Hanyu agrees. She asks if this is really okay with Oka, since the demand is getting so huge it's far outside of Oka's hands now. Oka agrees, and Hanyu asks her to leave the village with her family and Hanyu until whatever is going on dies down. Oka wants to think about this decision, so Hanyu leaves to go get some more medicine. Upon her return, she sees a beaten and tattered Oka surrounded by villagers holding weapons, tied up and being hung from a tree. They've killed Shoji already, and threaten to harm her daughter if she doesn't tell them about the apparent treasure hidden in Onigafuchi Swamp. Yes, the villagers have some weird delusions going on and believe Oka sold her soul to a demon for this medicine. Sounds a little peculiar. They all faked having an illness to receive medicine and sell it to local villagers nearby, and have now come to get some more to return to the feudal lord with. Infuriated by them stepping on Oka's goodwill, Hanyu proceeds to go on a rampage and begins murdering villagers. She comes to later, unsure how many she's killed, but kills three more as the village burns up in flames. She accepts that she has been demonified as she slaughters villagers, mocking some of them as they pray to be saved. Oka appears behind her and Hanyu asks if she's okay. She is met by her daughter with a sword swing instead, shocking her as Oka lets her blood flow over the blade of the sword. Hanyu realizes what she's doing, using her blood to make sure her attacks injure Hanyu something that she told her that would end your pure bloods long ago. She asks Oka why she's doing this, and Oka replies saying that humans and demons cannot live together. Hanyu calls humans the lowest, vilest creatures, making Oka start crying, saying that she knows they're garbage, but asks if she too is garbage since she's a human, addressing Hanyu as her mother. Hanyu is shocked that Oka has realized their connection. But before she questions her, Oka apologizes, saying that things turned out this way because she used her mother's ability to give miracles too much and led to the country fiending after medicine. Oka says that sacrificing one's life is the fate of those born to the Furude family, and calls Hanyu a monster. They begin to fight one another, and very quickly Oka starts losing really hard. She's smacked to the ground by our demonified Miko. Hanyu, completely blood hungry, says that she doesn't intend to kill Oka just yet, and that they are no longer any relation to each other except for enemies. Oka sees the villagers in the distance attempting to flee the burning town, and gets back to her knees to fight Hanyu more. She remembers Hanyu taught her that hands are an opponent's weak point, and aims for Hanyu's hands. Oka strikes all the way through, making Hanyu shriek in pain. She stands there, puzzled, as Oka assumes the stance that she usually used for killing demons and Oka's eyes turned a scarlet color as she too demonified. Oka says she can't let her kill any more people, and this reminds Hanyu of Riku. She begins to regret and wonder if those happy days she had really deserved to happen, begging her daughter to stop. Oka says goodbye to her mom, and then she stabs her. After this, Oka uses whatever strength she has left to go back to the Furude Shrine, and cries as Onigafuchi falls to pieces. And one night, she lost her husband, likely her daughter, many villagers, and she had to kill her own mother. She gets ready to take her own life as well when Hanyu appears, still alive and telling her that her death would be meaningless. Oka is shocked that she's still alive somehow, and Hanyu apologizes for everything she's done, but knows that no apology will truly justify all the harm that she's done to her daughter. Oka tries to keep it together through her apology, as Hanyu tells her that she needs to be killed by the Looper Sword or she'll become a demon again, and she would much rather die a mother than a demon. Oka refuses outright to do this since that she's back to normal now, she would never want to kill her own mother. Hanyu tells her that it's a daughter's duty to do this and is grateful that they don't share horns. Oka was able to grow up like a normal girl. She tells Oka that she must take the blame as the demon that destroyed Onigafuchi, and she'll take everyone's sins with her into the swamp. Oka tells her that even if she has horns, she's still a human at heart, to which Hanyu thanks her daughter, telling her to live for Fuka and her husband and everyone else she holds dear. Hanyu reminisces that meeting Riku and that becoming Oka's mother were the happiest moments of her life. They tell each other how happy they were to know one another as Oka wields the sword. Hanyu, hopeful that she'll reunite with Riku, tells Oka to stab her and then say an incantation as the blade grows to its three-pronged form. We don't see the axe of Oka stabbing Hanyu, 
but honestly, I'm a little glad we didn't, because I think it would be a little too heavy-hitting for me. Some time passes, and Oka opens her eyes the next morning, visiting the site where she stabbed her own mother. The sword is stained with her blood, and still in its three-pronged form. In the distance, she sees two figures approaching, her husband and her daughter, somehow still both alive. Shoji says that the villagers declared him dead after his lungs started bleeding, and Fuku was knocked unconscious in the Furuday house living room, but survived the fires. Mao and Shino rolled up shortly after in a massive reunion, and during their time of happiness, Oka swore to protect it, and create a world where sins aren't wiped away by sacrifice. Oka hopes that one day, Hanyu will be reincarnated and can enjoy the village with a smile. A small and rolled place, stating that after this, Oka was revered as the savior of Onigafuchi village. The feudal lord would leave the village alone in fear of the demons coming after him next, and he entrusted the rule of the village to both the Sonazaki and Kimiyoshi families. He would not meddle with the state of the village at all, and let them rule themselves. The three houses would grow great influence over the town because of this, and due to the events that transpired prior to this, they would all grow a huge amount of faith in Oyashira-sama. The sword would become known as Onigara no Ryu, probably said that wrong, but you know, which it's known as today in modern day Higurashi, and they toss it into the swamp. The three families would begin a tradition and festival known as Wata Nagashi, where offerings were drifted down their nearby river to purify the demon's grudge and their sins. Later, this event would be changed to Drifting Cotton, hence its title, the Cotton Drifting Festival. The final words would be that this story is an interpretation based off ancient documents, and that the actual events may be different, which puts this in a weird gray area of canon or non-canon. For a while, this was hotly debated, but after the events of Higurashi, Go, and Sotsu, and the sword appearing in Rei, and I think it also appears in Mei, I say that Kota Hogushihan is canon, making this the starting point on our timeline and where all events diverged from. Man, wasn't this story intense? I think Kota Hogushi is masterfully written and one of, if not the best arc in the series. It does a great job characterizing Hanyu and making her role in the series make much more sense, and delivers a ton of emotional and hard-hitting moments. It also sets up a lot of things, such as the Cod Drifting Festival, sets up the demon legend and rumors that we hear about from people in the town, explains why they moved away from the swamp and consider it dangerous, and quite a lot of other things as well, such as the syndrome that is Hinamizawa Syndrome. As I've said earlier, I might not have done this justice, so if you want to go read it for yourself, I'll provide a link down below to a playlist for the visual novel. But for now, that's it in the first installment of our Ultimate Higurashi Timeline. Join me next month when we go over the next part in the timeline. Thanks for watching this all the way through, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey,